uh, my today's uh, session. Uh, we will actually go through uh, some anatomy part, which uh, I wanted to share last time. So we are going to actually talk about the lumbar plexus and uh, how we can actually draw the lumbar plexus. And uh, in an easy, the easy way to actually uh, draw, draw that. Okay. So let's start with that. So the lumbar plexus takes origin from L2, L3, L4. Um, L4, L5 forms part of the lumbosacral trunk. And then we can divide these into ventral divisions and uh, dorsal divisions. And the femoral nerve takes origin from the, uh, you know, L2, L3, L4 dorsal division. L1 also participates in the lumbar plexus and gives rise to inguinal, ilio, inguinal and iliohypogastric nerve. Iliohypogastric nerves get, say, branch from T12 as well. And uh, L1, L2 also forms the genital femoral nerve, uh, which obviously divides into the genital branch and the femoral branch. The L2, L3, L4 are the ventral divisions form. That's wrong. It's actually uh, the obturator. Ventral division is form forms the obturator, not the uh, uh, femoral. The dorsal division actually forms the uh, femoral nerve, not the uh, ventral division. So uh, that's actually uh, wrongly labeled. L2, L3 dorsal division uh, also form the little cutaneous femoral nerve. So, uh, so that should be little cutaneous and the femoral, not the obturator. So that's actually, I think, uh, wrong in this uh, diagram. So drawing the uh, lumbar plexus itself uh, with the, uh, you know, uh, showing uh, the actual anatomy, the gross anatomy. Uh, so there's this T12 and we go L1, L2, uh, transverse process and the bodies of the uh, vertebrae. And that's L3. And similarly, you can actually draw the other ones as well, L4. So that's very easy. It's not very difficult to actually draw these uh, diagrams. So now what we're going to do is uh, with a different color, now we're actually going to draw the uh, iliopsoas muscle, which takes origin from T2, L1, L2, L3, L4. Uh, so that's our psoas muscle. And we know that the uh, nerves lie in the uh, psoas uh, compartment. Okay, they take origin uh, from the uh, L1, L2, L3, L4. Take. Uh, so that's our, um, uh, the IM. So that's the anterior superior leg spine. And we got the pubic tubercle. And joining these two is the, your inguinal ligament. So that will be our inguinal ligament. Okay, so that's the inguinal ligament. So you need to keep labeling uh, the, you know, yeah, so that's it. And then that's the iliacus muscle. Uh, so it's iliopsoas, isn't it? That iliopsoas takes, uh, you know, uh, tend to insert into the less medial side of the femur into the lesser trochanter. Okay. And coming on the lateral side is our uh, femoral nerve. Okay, it goes behind the inguinal ligament. Okay, and on the medial side is the obturator nerve, line of obturator, okay. And then you have the other nerves as well. So that's the obturator on the medial side, uh, femoral on the lateral side. Okay. And then we have our a little cutaneous femoral nerve or the little cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Okay, so that 
comes out of sort of midway onto the uh, psoas. Sheath, it pierces, so our sheath comes out of that. Okay, I'm nice on the side. Okay. You're going in a minute, I actually go and show. So that, that was uh, our uh, lumbar plexus and the, uh, you know, diagrams. We can have, there's another simple diagram, which I'll actually, I had shown in the, in the, uh, in a previous lecture, where you can actually draw a sort of a cross section and explain uh, our, uh, you know, how we block the uh, femoral nerve, how we do the facial ear cup block. So that is another one which we can actually uh, draw. I'll post that uh, sometimes on the uh, group. So coming to today's lecture, we have six lectures today. Uh, so the first one uh, is on ophthal, so that's about oculocardic reflex. Second one is in obstetrics, thrombocytopenia. Uh, third one is cardiac on pacemakers. Uh, fourth one is on hemofiltration, so intensive care. And then we have uh, one on cardiopulmonary bypass. There's again cardiac, and we have the basic anatomy of our uh, coral block. Or, okay. So coming to the first question, the question is: uh, What is oculocardic reflex? Uh, what is the mechanism and presentation of reflex during the strabismus surgery? And what are the management approaches to prevent or treat the oculocardiac reflex? So this is not a very difficult question. This is actually a pretty easy question. So this reflex is also known as Ashner phenomena, Ashner reflex or Ashner Daganini reflex. It's a trigeminal vagal reflex response. So uh, it originates in the trigeminal area and the response is effected through the vagal nerve. And it is elicited by pain, pressure, manipulation of the eyeball. And hence, it is quite common during the uh, surgery on the eyeball, okay. And especially the strabismus surgery. And it manifests as cardiac arrhythmias and hypotension, okay. You can also draw a simple diagram uh, of the eyeball and the muscles. So the efferents uh, go through the uh, long and short ciliary nerves, uh, pass through the uh, ciliary ganglia, uh, via the ophthalmic division of the fifth cranial nerve. And the integration occurs uh, in the medulla and the floor of the fourth ventricle. And the efferent arises from the nucleus tractus solitarius, okay, which is obviously part of the fifth cranial nerve, okay. and in the medulla. So, and then through the vagus nerve, uh, it actually reaches the heart. So that's in diagnostic form. Uh, you will also need to actually write. So, like I said, efferents come through the long and short ciliary nerve pass through the ciliary ganglia along the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve, and then terminate in the main uh, trigeminal sensory nucleus in the floor of the fourth ventricle. So the integration occurs in the medulla, and the efferents then pass, uh, they start in the uh, nucleus tractus solitarius uh, of the vagal uh, cardiac depressor nerve, and then pass on to the heart and where they actually eat effect, the neg negative anotropic and condensation effect. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, you get the uh, bradycardia and other, uh, you know, arrhythmias and hypertension. So the mechanism and presentation, uh, I said this is very common during strabismus surgery in children. Uh, the incidence can be as high as 30 to 90%. And the presentation is usually uh, bradycardia, sorry for the spelling mistake there, and hypotension. 
but it can even lead to asystolic arrest. And this is seen in one in 2,200 cases. And the factors that predispose to the uh, arrhythmias and hypertension uh, or the increase in incidence of the ocular cardiac reflex is hyperventilation with hypercarbia. So increase in PCO2 is important. What about the management? Obviously, the first thing you will likely ask is a surgeon to stop manipulating, stop pre putting pressure on the eye. Okay. Sometimes they, you know, you, uh, when surgery is actually going on on the head end and uh, the head is hidden and like they're doing surgery on the mouth or third, sometimes even the surgeons, uh, you know, assistant pressing on the eyeball can lead to this reflex. So, uh, you need to protect the eye uh, from the pressure effect. So the first thing you're going to ask is ask them to relieve the pressure or stop operating. Uh, you can actually give a tropin and glycoprolate. Um, some people tend to give prophylactically or others just wait and see what happens. And despite of this, if it still occurs, then you make sure that the surgeon is told to be gentle with uh, manipulation. Uh, from our side, we need to make sure that uh, the patient is being ventilated. There is adequately ventilated that the CO2 levels are normal. And if despite all these measures, uh, if the, there is still, uh, you know, the surgeon is still very gentle and still happening, you can then ask to actually a uh, surgeon to inject some local anesthetic into the muscle. So this will actually block the afferent fibers. And if obviously it is a cardiac arrest happens, then you will need to uh, start CPR. So you start cardiac compressions. Uh, so management depends on the presentation. So some things can be done prophylactically, others need to actually manage it as we go. Okay. So that was our first question of the day. The second question of the day are, you are called to see a priming carrier with preeclampsia in the first stage of labor and she's requesting an epidural. And then uh, you look at our platelet counts when you're doing the examination and investigations, you look at, and the platelet counts are 60,000, but that was last night. So what are your differential diagnosis? And outline how and why you would proceed, okay? Or would you proceed? So, uh, during the pregnancy, uh, the platelet counts do go down by 20%. And it is seen that uh, almost 90% of the patients actually have platelet counts about 150,000. 6% have counts between 125 to 150. 3% have 100 to 125 or 134,000. And 0.6% uh, have from 80,000 to 90,000. 99,000 or 100,000. And only 1%, oh, sorry, 0.1% has from 60 to 80,000. So patients with counts of less than 60,000 is very rare. Also, you need to be aware that uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, whether it is static or dynamic. So if you, you know, look at uh, predilect counts over the uh, last few times, and you'll see and uh, look at whether uh, they have been static or there has been a dynamic drop or this is a one-off reading. That is actually important, okay. So uh, moderate to severe thrombocytopenia is considered as counts uh, less than uh, 100,000. And um, the commonest differential diagnosis in this case is going to be gestational thrombocytopenia. Uh, which is present in 59,000, sorry, 59% of the patients. But like we said that in gestational thrombocytopenia, the counts do not actually go down to such uh, low levels, okay. So you have to start thinking of other causes, okay. Things like preeclampsia uh, with severe features or health syndrome, which actually is a differential diagnosis. This is seen in 22% of patients. HELP obviously is an acronym for hemolysis, elevated liver function tests, and low platelets. Could it be immune thrombocytopenia? Okay, so ITP that is seen in 11% of patients. 
And then there are other causes. Okay, so other causes are seen in 8% of patients. So causes like antiphospholipid syndrome, DIC, dilution and thrombocytopenia, uh, myeloproliferative neoplasms, drug-induced thrombocytopenia, infected causes like HIV or hepatitis, inherited causes like von Willebrand disease type 2. Okay, these can also present with thrombocytopenia. So we need to be aware of these causes. And like I said, as platelet counts of 60,000 are at least very rarely seen. So you need to actually go into the history. So you need to look at the past medical, surgical, anesthetic history as you would do in any patient. You need to look at the course of the pregnancy so far, and uh, you need to look uh, for any presence or absence of complications. You need to ask the patients if there is any signs of infection, if there has been history of fever with chills and rigors. You need to look at if the patient has been introduced any medication, to introduce to any new medication in the past three weeks, or is the patient taking any occasional medications which may cause thrombocytopenia? A family history or personal history of excessive bleeding, bruising, complication, pregnancy associated complication, or is there any known thrombotic microangiopathic syndromes present, history of that present? Okay, this is important. You need to look at the history of systemic lupus, erythematosus, SLE, or other autoimmune disorders. Is there a history of liver disease? And we need to look at the timing of drop in platelets. Which trimester did it happen? Has it been throughout the pregnancy or it has only happened in the later part of the pregnancy where there is maximum dilution of the volume markers? And is there presence of anemia? Okay. That is, that is more than expected for the stage of pregnancy. Again, dilution and anemia occurs, but is this more than uh, what is expected? And we also need to look at the abnormalities of peripheral blood smear. I can look at for abnormal white cells or uh, nucleated red blood cells. So a peripheral smear will be very useful in this patient. So you do not just proceed uh, with someone with 60,000, a count of 60,000. It is actually very uncommon to have patients with such uh, low counts. You obviously will also look at uh, the patient's vitals like heart rate, blood pressures, SpO2. You would examine the skin for purpura or bruising or petechiae. And you will also ensure there's no clinical evidence of bleeding or excessive bleeding or as a patient oozing from the venous side or you know, other procedural areas where you can look at areas from where they have taken blood. Is she clotting? Okay. Uh, you would also do a systemic examination looking at the respiratory system, cardiovascular system, CNS, GIT, et cetera. Okay. In the investigations, you will look for the uh, full blood count, look at the platelet counts again, like say, you might want to see bleeding time not done nowadays that commonly. Okay. Uh, clotting screen, you look at APTT, PT, and fibrinogen. If uh, you have facility for thromboelastogram, that's nothing like it. Okay, the uh, maximum amplitude should be more than 53 millimeters. Okay. So if that is there, then the platelet count from 54, less than 50 to 75,000 are considered to be okay. If you have access to a platelet function analyzer, Okay, so there are two types. They have uh, the uh, the CEPI or CADP. Okay, so they, this is the collagen uh, uh, with 150 micrometer aperture. And then you look for the closing time for the aperture. So, uh, you know, these are two types of predator function analyzers, okay. You look at the urea and creatinine and you look at liver function test and we will come to that. Uh, why we need to look at that, you need to look at the urine analysis. So this is the analysis of, so if the patient has got isolated thrombocytopenia, okay, then you start looking for severe ITP or drug-induced ITP. If the patient has history of fill, uh, uh, fever and chills, uh, then you start looking for infection signs of the IC. If the patient has severe hypertension on examination, then think of preeclampsia with severe clinical features like have HELP syndrome or look for possible uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. If the patient is uh, hypotensive, 
Is there been excessive bleeding or DIC? Are there any signs of neurological findings? Then look for possible central venous system bleeding, uh, preeclampsia, DIC, or TTP. If the patient has got bloody diarrhea, then look for shiza, shiga toxin mediated hemolytic uremic syndrome. If this is very rare, STHUS, and possible thrombotic microangiopathy. If there is hemolytic anemia, there's you will see drop in hemoglobin. Uh, there'll be rise in LDH and bilirubin. Okay. Uh, these could be signs of preeclampsia with severe clinical features, DIC or TDP. Yeah. On the blood smear, if you see cystocytes on the blood smear, then you start thinking of thrombotic thrombocytopenia or look for the uh, complement related uh, thrombotic macroangiopathy or CTMA. Uh, this could also be seen in preeclampsia with severe clinical features or HELP syndrome, possibly DIC. If there is leukopenia or leukocytosis, again, look for signs of infection and DIC. If you see prolonged PT and APTT with low fibrinogen, again, look for signs of DIC or severe liver disease. If there is rapidly increased creatinine, so you look at the trend for creatinine, then you think of the complement associated uh, thrombotic uh, macroangiopathy or the STHUS, which I actually talked about, Shigat. Okay toxin related uh, okay. or DIC. Okay. If there is elevated liver functions, then you think of preeclampsia with severe clinical features, health syndrome, or AFLP, that is acute fatty liver pregnancy, infection, example, viral illnesses can also cause that. If the patient has low blood sugar, then you start thinking of acute fatty liver pregnancy. And if on urinalysis they actually have proteinuria, then you think of preeclampsia or HALP syndrome. So uh, this is the overall analysis of the various findings uh, you can actually look at. Like I've said, if you actually got thromboelastogram, nothing like it, you can uh, do analysis of that. I look for if the MA is, the maximum amplitude is actually more than uh, 53. So this is a, from blastogram, R value, the your K value, the angle, okay, R K value, the maximum amplitude. So these are various values, and we will actually take a class on that sometime. So how do you manage it? First of all, you need to actually decide: is epidural really necessary in this case? And then you have to look at and rather rule out the uh, causes for the thrombocytopenia. You don't want to actually get into a, into a mess um, where there are other uh, complications are present. You need to actually inform the patient of the uh, potential risks and benefits. You know, there is a one in 150,000 to 250,000 chances of patient developing epidural hematoma. In this case, even though, uh, we can actually do spinal in patients with, you know, 62 to 75,000, but is it really necessary? And if there is a strong indication, then you might want to consider platelet transfusion uh, for which you will need to consult the hematologist and also discuss the case with obstetrician. And if it's just purely for analgesia purposes, you had to think, well, we could actually uh, think of other methods of analgesia. Could this possible patient have a PCA? All patient could actually have, use Antonox and use uh, you know, complementary therapies. So that we have to start looking at other alternatives, but that does not mean we would stop thinking of uh, this because the patients end up uh, for cesarean section uh, we would still need some help. So it's important that the hematologists are involved uh, with this case and they would investigate further, take a peripheral smear, go through the history and find out what the cause for this uh, severe uh, thrombocytopenia in this case is. So for epidural anesthesia in such cases, uh, general rule is um, epidural is normally thought safe if uh, the platelet counts are more than 50,000 to 80,000, but their counts are stable. 
So it's important to look at the dynamic range of platelets. You don't actually look at a single reading and say that. And the platelet function is normal. That means that the platelets which are there are of good quality. It's important to rule out that the patient is not on any antiplatelets or anticoagulant drugs. Okay. And there are no other acquired inherited coagulation disorders. Okay. So count, function, and quality are important part of the epidural anesthesia. And count is just one of the numbers you are actually looking at. Coming to the third question. Third question is about a patient presenting for total hip replacements. He tells you that he has a pacemaker. So what further information do you require? And how will this influence your anesthetic management? So the first thing you need to know is what is the indication? Why did the patient actually end up with a pacemaker? So there are a number of indications and uh, it could just be symptomatic sinus bradycardia, the patient has complete heart block. It could be because patient has sense, uh, sinus node uh, disease or sick sinus syndrome. It could be symptomatic uh, uh, AV node uh, disease like bivascular, bivascular and trivascular block. It could be tachyarrhythmias. Hocum, dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, long QT syndromes are other important ones. And more recently, uh, the pacemakers have been used uh, for heart failure, uh, for remodeling. It's been used in sleep disorder breathing. They've been used uh, post MI, and they've been used in patients with poor LV function. So it's important to know uh, what kind of pacemaker it is. Obviously, um, if the patient has got a pacemaker, temporary pacemaker, you will see the unit outside, but this patient probably had got a permanent pacemaker. And again, if it's a permanent or a pacemaker, uh, does this patient have the, uh, you know, the uh, card, uh, which will tell us what kind of pacemaker it is. So the pacemakers are uh, classified according to the uh, NAP, NASPE, that is the North American Society of Pacing and Electrophysiology and British Pacing and Electrophysiology Group, or BPA. So it will tell you when uh, the pacemaker was inserted, what kind it is, when what is all last tested. So you need to actually have, ask the patient if they got the pacemaker card. Then you will need to know, is it functioning well? When it was cited, when was it last uh, serviced or when it was last tested? A chest X-ray will show the position of the pacemaker, it will show the leads, and it, some of them can also show you uh, the type uh, uh, through their radio opaque codes. Okay. So X-ray can sh uh, show that. So this is look like this is an ICD. Uh, you can actually see the, the uh, thick wire, uh, which delivers shock, okay. And you can actually see the two leads coming in. So X-rays are actually a useful part for that. Uh, this is a NASP or the BPAEG uh, pacemaker course, and uh, it uh, talks about uh, the first letter is for pacing chamber, second for sensing chamber, uh, third is the response. Uh, fourth is a programmability, and uh, fifth one is antitachycardia function. O is none, A is for atrium, I is for inhibited, P for programmable, P for pacing as well, uh, V is for ventricle, T for trigger, D for dual, um, M is for multiprogrammable, C is for communicating, R is for rate modulation, S is for shock, and D is for dual, that is for pacing and shock. So patients can present with various kind of uh, pacemaker units. Thing. So for part of anesthesia, we know that uh, if you use succinethonium, it causes fasciculation. And sometimes this fasciculation can be misinterpreted as cardiac impulses. And uh, this could lead to inhibition of pacemaker output. Okay, depending on the type of pacemaker. The other worry is obviously is a surgical diathermy. I talked about it last time. 
and uh, they can interfere again with the sensing unit. And uh, the other thing is, uh, if you the energy passes through the uh, pacing unit can destroy the unit, or it can heat up the wire and dis and cause damage to the uh, sensing part of the uh, you know the wires. So uh, that's the main worry about uh, you know anesthesia part. Then the next question is that, oh, can we use base, uh, magnet externally phase? Well, it all depends. And um, if it is simple programmable demand unit, uh, putting a pacemaker, uh, sorry, the magnet uh, can bypass the sensing unit and it can actually then reprogram this to a fixed road, uh, rate or asynchronous rate. But if it is a multi unit or multi Will uh, pacemaker. Um, it may be reprogrammed by diathermy, and this uh, uh, instability can be enhanced by external magnet. Uh, so this may not be the best way. And uh, very rarely, I mean, this is VO or types of pacemakers are very rarely used. Uh, these are usually not affected by external. Uh, magnet. So you actually have to need, the magnets are normally used to find uh, the battery life for the pacemakers. But certain uh, pacemaker units, uh, if you place them on the, uh, uh, you know, the unit itself, pacemaker unit, uh, they can uh, turn it into uh, the uh, fixed mode. And these are very useful in the emergency situations. But this is not an emergency case. This is an elective or semi-elective case. So there is a time uh, to find out what kind of pacemaker this patient had. And accordingly, you can then decide uh, what do you need to do with it. Okay. If the patient has got an ICD, then it needs to be switched off uh, before the patient gets to the theater. And then again, once it comes out, then you can actually get it uh, switched on or reprogrammed. And uh, when they switched on or off, that time the uh, pacing unit can be turn to a fixed mode. So the investigation, we will look at to a lead ECG, we'll look at the rhythm, uh, you look at the evidence of electrical capture, chest x-ray, like I have said, we will look at the portion of the uh, pacing box, uh, integrity of leads, we'll look at whether there are any fractures. We can also find out from where the uh, pacing wires have been placed into. Okay. And uh, some pacemakers, like I said, you can actually look at what type it is, um, but not all pacemakers, you can do that. It's important to actually make sure the electrolytes are normal because hyperkalemia uh, can cause abnormalities in capture. Okay? So it can lead to loss of capture. I'll talk about reprogramming, and uh, uh, this is important, uh, especially if they have ICD or if patients uh, have the antitachycardia uh, function, again, that's the implant will defibrillator with the ICD. These are very, very important. Okay. Intraoperatively, uh, the best thing to do is to actually use bipolar diathermy, uh, use the minimum energies and use in short bursts. And uh, the plate or the indifferent electrode should be sighted as far as possible uh, from the pacemaker unit and make sure the current doesn't pass through the basic unit or the wires. Okay. And if you're looking at the uh, defibrillation, so if you're worried that something might go wrong, uh, place a pad uh, anteriorly uh, on the chest. And so this anterior posterior uh, placement is useful. Yeah. Again, you avoid the energy passing uh, through the unit or through the wires. Yeah. After the surgery, it's important that the patient is in the uh, monitored area. It goes into the recovery and uh, the HDU. And uh, they would need a recheck of the function uh, would be required. Now the new guidelines actually say that if the patient actually has got a simple pacemaker, it has been checked within the last three to six months. And the surgery is on the peripheral area where there's not going to be any uh, you know, current passing through the unit. Then you don't need to actually have 
anything. You don't need to do anything at all. And interoperatively, if there have been no changes in the rhythm, there have been no, uh, you know, problems. And again, you don't need a post-op check. So these are the latest units, uh, you know, guidelines uh, about the pacemakers. The fourth question is on uh, uh, ITU. It is about the uh, physical principles underlying hemofiltration. Uh, list the indications, contraindication, and complication of hemofiltration. So the basic principle of hemofiltration is, is about the delta pressure. So delta pressure is the inflow pressure uh, plus the outflow pressure, the mean of that minus the filtration pressure. So that is your transmembrane pressure. So that's the basics of the pressure. Okay. So there are two things that you need to know is about one is the diffusion, another is the convection. So when movement of solute occurs um, along the concentration gradient across the membrane, what will happen is that it'll, the solute will move till there is an equal gradient across the membrane. So that is what diffusion is. So this is the, the concentration. But when uh, water driven by hydrostatic or osmotic pressure uh, for, uh, across the uh, semipermeable membrane, it will carry the solute along with it as well. Okay. So this is called a, a solvent drag occur. So not only the uh, water passes through the uh, uh, membrane, and it also takes along uh, the solutes along with it. Okay. So you are actually uh, getting uh, better clearance of the uh, solutes. Uh, so if you look at the graph of the uh, molecular weight of the particles are on the uh, x-axis, the clearance on the y-axis. So when it's, if you look at the, diffu uh, the diffusion uh, clearance, it is, uh, you know, slower or less efficient than the convective clearance. So like I was saying, the transmembrane uh, pressure is equal to the hydrostatic pressure minus the oncotic pressure. So the larger molecules cannot pass through the, uh, the membrane, uh, like your albumin and large proteins, they can't. So they, they actually have the oncotic pressure, that's a transmembrane. Uh, uh, pressure that will actually hold the fluid within the compartment, but the smaller particles will. Okay. So what is filtered out across the membrane, and that is determined by the type of mem membrane. It uh, determined by the hemat hematocrit and the serum albumin. So this is other ones which will determine the oncotic pressure. Uh, it will depend on type of vascular axis or being veni uh, venovenous or arteriovenous. Artery venous is not used much now. And mean artery pressure uh, only depends of its arterial venous. Uh, but otherwise, if it's venous venous, then we actually use a pump. And it also depends on whether you're using a pump or suction at the ultrafiltrate uh, uh, part as well. So this is a basic of all kinds of uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, renal therapy. Uh, so you have the hemofiltration, uh, you have the blood pump, uh, which pumps the blood through the hemofiltrate. Uh, you can have a pump for dialysate, uh, you can have pump for effluent. Okay. And we can actually use pump for pre-dilution and post-dilution. And uh, we can also add uh, the, we have to add, uh, you know, anticoagulants, obviously, uh, so that the uh, filters don't clog. So particles which are less than 20,000 Daltons are filtered passively. So these are sodium, potassium, bicarb, ammonia, glucose. Some of the soluble endogenous substances like myoglobin, insulin, interleukins. Uh, some, ex uh, you know, certain exogenous substances circulating in plasma like uh, your medication like vancomycin, heparin, and toxins uh, like endotoxins and pesticides. 
Uh, solids of less than 100 Daltons are, uh, you know, urea, creatinine, uric acid, sodium, potassium, ionized calcium, and uh, drugs that are not bound to plasma protein. Uh, these are all are easily filtered out. So all the continuous venovenous uh, hemofilters are impermeable to albumin and solids which are more than 50,000 Daltons. Okay. So it is only particles which are like less than 20,000 Daltons which are seen. So if you look at the creatinine clearance, uh, it depends on the type of fibers we have said. So most of us actually uh, use uh, hollow fibers and this will lead to creatinine clearance of around uh, 10 ml per minute. And clearance as is defined as the amount of plasma cleared of the substance, okay? So it's not the amount of the solute, <laughs> it's the amount of the plasma which is cleared of the subs, uh, you know, cleared of the substance. Yeah. So it's 10 ml per minute for hollow fibers, it's 20 ml per minute for pallet plate. And this is without a use of dialysate, but if you use dialysate along, uh, you know, with hemofiltration, uh, then this clearance can be increased to 25 ml per minute. Uh, so it can be quite high here. And it's also important what material the hemofilters are made of. They should be biocompatible. Uh, these are normally made of polysulfone or polyacronitrile or polyamides. And these substances do not cause activation of the complement and do not cause leukopenia. Leukopenia and the complement activation uh, can be seen with uh, some of the hemodialysis filters. So uh, this is uh, the uh, basic of the hemofiltration. So we have the uh, extracorporeal pump uh, because this is venovenous filtration, hemofiltration. Uh, we draw blood, it passes through the uh, filter and then you replace the fluid. So uh, pre-replacement fluid is normally not done. And again, uh, we do not normally use dialysate uh, along uh, with uh, the hemofiltration, but it can be used. It can be used. If you want to improve uh, the uh, you know, clearance, then you can. Continuous uh, arteriovenous hemofiltration uh, and this uh, one, it uses the mean artery pressure. So you, one port is in the artery line, other is the venous. So return occurs through the venous or uh, that. So this will depend on the mean artery pressure of the patient. And continuous venous venous uh, filtration, uh, so you can you can actually have replacement fluid, and like I was explaining before, uh, when uh, there is uh, you know convection, uh, then you can actually increase the amount of uh, the ultra filtrate, and this can uh, go as high as thirty five liters per day, or twenty to twenty five ml per kg per hour. Coming to number question number five is on cardiopulmonary bypass in adults. And uh, so what are the principles of cardiopulmonary bypass and what are the main complications of this technique? So basically a cardiopulmonary bypass replaces the function of your circulation. And this is done by ensuring that there is organ perfusion. So perfusion pressure is important. And there is oxygenation Okay, so oxygen need to be added and carbon dioxide need to be removed because you're bypassing the cardiac as well as the pulmonary circulation. So for this, we need to know what are the components of the cardiopulmonary bypass. We will need a venous line. So this comes from the vena cava and whatever is collect collected uh, from this line is drained into a reservoir uh, where the oxygenation occurs and carbon dioxide is removed. So there can be two types of oxygenator. We have bubble oxygenator. So oxygen is bubbled through the perfusate. Okay, so these are cheaper, uh, but then they require deforming because as you bubble through the blood, it starts forming and then this can cause air embolism. At the same time, it can also damage the red blood components. So bubble oxygenators were used in children, but mostly uh, we use membrane oxygenator, oxygenators. And uh, this is the gas exchange tape it takes place across the semi membrane. 
So there's less chances of embolization and damage to the RBCs. Then once the blood is oxygenated, it needs to be returned back. And this is through the arterial line. And this is done in the ascending aorta via pump. And these pumps uh, can be pulse style or non-pulse style. And there are obviously lots of pumps, the pumps to pump in the uh, cold cardioplagia, uh, which will con uh, contain potassium uh, to keep the heart in a arrested position. And they also contain an energy substrate for metabolism. Uh, we have a pump for the ventricular drain uh, to vent the heart. Okay because there may be some amount of aortic regurgitation uh, if there's no proper aortic clamp. And there can also be blood uh, collecting through the bronchial and Thebesian vein, uh, which can lead to over distension of the left ventricle. And this uh, can cause critical ischemia. And uh, this can lead to post bypass dysfunction. So it's important to actually have a good ventricular drain as well. There are filters, 27 micron filters on both sides of the circulation. Uh, this is to remove air and any microemboli. And uh, these can cause uh, reduction in platelets. Uh, there are heat exchanges along with the oxygenators. Uh, this is important to maintain the temperature. And uh, the hypothermia reduces oxygen demand by 6 to 9% uh, per degree fall in cold temperatures. So this is important. As, okay, so patients are actually kept uh, cold. And towards the end, we need to also warm them up. So it's for both cooling as well as warming. So the other thing which is important is priming. Uh, so what do you prime the whole system with? There's a large volume, uh, nearly 1.5 to 2.5 liters. Uh, so the priming is usually done with crystalloids or colloid or crystalloid combination. Um, in adults, uh, mostly uh, just crystalloids. And because of this priming, there can be acute hemodilation. Uh, which will happen uh, when the bypass is established. But sometimes if the patient has low hemoglobin, then the blood can be used uh, to maintain a hematocrit of 20 to 25%. Blood is normally used in periodic cardiac surgeries. The other important thing is anticoagulation is very crucial because you don't want the system to coagulate and a coagulation occur within the system and then everything that will be lethal. Okay because the surface, the tubing are all synthetic surface and this can actually lead to activation of coagulation and this can lead to thrombosis uh, within the system and within the oxygenator. And that's why ACT monitoring is a very important part of cardiopulmonary bypass. So total heparinization is done. So ACT monitoring is done to maintain the coagulation but also for reversing the heparinization. So when you actually reverse uh, the heparin, that's also important. So we can actually see in this diagram, they can see the vena cava, superior inferior vena cava uh, that is collected. You can actually see the ventricular drains, you can see the pumps, the filters, oxygenator, the blood being written back to the ascending aorta. Or you can draw a simple diagram. So you go to the heart, you collect the blood in the heart into the reservoir, and uh, uh, you also collect from the left ventricle with a filter. It goes through the oxygenator and the heat exchanger, passes through the filter and bubble catcher and pumped back into the ascending aorta. Okay, there's extra filter as well, so or the pump as well to collect the blood from the left side. Okay. So that's again in a simple diagram, uh, which can be used uh, in the exams. I think that, um, you can describe the each component, uh, but trying to actually tell um, why a diagram, it makes so much of sense and makes it easier for examiner to give a good marks. Okay. So complications can be on the, on the circuit side. On the venous side, there could be low return, and this can be because there is bleeding happening, there's obstruction, there's airlock, or there's aortic dissection. On the arterial side, it could be the cannula may kink and there could be block of uh, failure to deliver ad adequate flow. Uh, if there is inadequate left ventricular ven uh, venting, in that case, there can be cardiac distension. There can be failure of oxygenation and removal of carbon dioxide. 
Uh, the pump, if the aortic cannula is in the wrong plane, that can cause aortic dissection. And as I mentioned, it's important to maintain coagulation, so maintain ACT. And uh, so if, if coagulation is inadequate, then it uh, can lead to problems. And the reversal with protamine is again done uh, based on ACT. Uh, but protamine itself has its own problems, and so there can be reaction to protamine, uh, which can lead to anaphylactoid reaction, histamine release, hypertension, permeable hypertension, and uh, there is uh, chances of embolization because of the uh, oxygenator air or air being sucked in, uh, silicon from the part of the tubing, uh, fat uh, embolization, platelet aggregation. These can actually happen. Then there can be complications related to perfusion. Uh, so hypothermia is maintained like that. And uh, um, now the people tend to actually go for normal thermic or not go for very low temperatures, but you know, uh, when very low temperatures are there, then there can be coagulopathy, hyperglycemia, there is slowing of drug metabolism. And uh, the priming is required at in the initially, so they can be overloaded because of fluids. Uh, coagulopathy is possible. Um, this can happen because of the complement activation, but it can also happen uh, because of the decrease in the platelet numbers um, and, the, and the depletion of factor five and eight. And this is seen with, uh, you know, when the coagulopathy bypass is more than two hours. Then uh, there can be myocardial stunning after cardioplasia, okay, and that's why it's important to have cold cardioplasia. Uh, Complement activation can lead to post perfusion lung. Uh, so this is ARDS kind of picture. Uh, renal function is known, you know, dysfunction is known as the um, uh, bypass decreases the renal blood flow and gallbladder filtration rate by almost 30%. And uh, so it worsens as with the duration of the cardiopulmonary bypass. There can be problems with the central, through the central nervous system because embolization or hypoperfusion, hypoperfusion leading to post potential ischemia of the brain. Uh, but embolization of the air, thrombus, debris, silicon can also cause subtle uh, kind of post bypass deficits. Uh, gastrointestinal system, there can be hypoperfusion of this planktonic bed, and this can lead to critical gut ischemia, pancreatic ischemia, the liver dysfunction. And this is not uncommon. Again, it's been in a patient requiring a laparotomy in the middle of the night because the lactates refuse to actually come down and they open and you see the blood gut. <laughs> Last question of the day is on anatomy. So this is uh, describe the anatomy of the caudal or sacral epidural space and discuss the indications uh, for this caudal epidural block. So anatomy uh, part, uh, caudal epidural space, uh, this is a cavity uh, which is uh, triangular in cross section and it is running uh, along the length of the sacrum. Uh, superiorly, we have the lumbar vertebral canal. Uh, inferiorly, it uh, has sacral hiatus. Anteriorly, we have the vertebral bodies. Posteriorly, we have the laminae. And laterally, we have the anterior and posterior sacral uh, foramina. Okay. So that's the uh, caudal, caudal space. Okay. What does the uh, caudal space contain? It contains the dural sac. There is phylum terminale. Uh, there are sacral nerve roots, coccygeal nerve roots. There are venous plexus. There's fatty tissues, the fibrous strands, or the uh, you know connective tissue. So these are the contents uh, of the um, caudal space. So wherever there are nerves, there are blood vessels. Okay, there is fatty tissue. So nothing. Nothing uh, in, uh, special about this, okay. So we can also draw simple diagrams, okay. So like a triangle and uh, that's called, then you can draw this sacral prominence and then uh, you got the coccyx, you got the 
you know, sacrum uh, with the, the positive sphere legs point. Uh, the triangle is the coral space, and above is the uh, your lumbar. I think. So that's the sacral hiatus there. Okay. So patient is normally lying on the side, but it can be also be done prone. Uh, you feel for the coral space. You feel for the corner. Uh, the posterior iliac spine and the sacral hiatus they form an isosceles triangle. You introduce an, uh, the needle at around uh, you know, 45 degrees, pierce the sacral coccygeal membrane. You feel a give through, you feel a pop through that. And once you get that, then you have to reduce the angle uh, to move the needle in and, and then inject local anesthetic after a negative aspiration. There are lots of anatomical uh, variations in this area. In the elderly, the co uh, sacrococcyl membrane might be uh, you know, calcified and sometimes it's difficult to enter the space. So you have to remember that. The volume of the uh, sacral, uh, the caudal space is around uh, 25 to 30 mLs in females and almost up to 30 to 35 mLs in males. So if you don't use that volume, so minimum volume in females should be around 25 mLs and in males around 30 to 35 mLs. So if you don't use that volume, you're not gonna get a good block uh, with caudal anesthesia. So indications is commonly used in pediatrics. In pediatrics, uh, there is formula for how much amount of local anesthetic you can use. It's 0.25% or depending on the volume, you can actually get the level from the, your inguinal area till the umbilicus and even you can reach the thorax. So in pediatrics, it's technically simple, it's reliably effective. Uh, it's used for circumcision, hernia repair, there's a common indication, but it's been used uh, for others as well. So it has been used uh, in, like I said, up to abdominal surgeries. You can, the larger the volume you use, uh, the higher the level you can actually get. People can have done even put catheters from the caudal space up to the thoracic level in pediatrics. Uh, in adults, it can be used for perineal operation. Um, I was explaining anatomy is not easy, uh, but it's been used for hemorrhoids and other perianal uh, procedures. And it's usually used as single shot combined with GA in the adults. It can be used in obstetrics uh, for forceps delivery. Um, it can be used for pain relief after episiotomy. Uh, Prontinous caudal for pain relief uh, during labor can be used, especially in the last stage when you uh, see patients having a lot of pressure. Um, can be part combined for part for the lower uh, part of this uh, surgery on the lower limb, but rarely used because uh, you only get uh, some parts of the sacral nerves, you don't actually get complete. So it has to be combined with other blocks. Uh, Transurethral operations, this is a good indication uh, and it can be used uh, and pain clinics is commonly used as a therapeutic indications for that for pain clinics. So it can be used uh, for certain uh, pain syndromes. Okay. So with this, uh, we've finished uh, today's session and uh, we'll see you uh, later next week. And I will also uh, tell you the topics I will cover uh, in the next session. Okay, see you.